What's going on, y'all? So we are back again for another movie corner. Celebrating uh, Black History Month. So we're doing all black movies, black casting movies this month. Um, but today we are doing Why Do Fools Fall in Love? I feel like this movie is such an underrated movie, but it is such a classic in my opinion because it's one of those biopics that you learn a lot, especially if you never know anything about this. And it's so fascinating because of the whole backstory on the uh, Frankie Lyman. Baby, I grew up and I used to hear the, um, because um, my grandmama, my grandma used to play like the oldie stations and stuff like that. So all of the old songs that I know about and where my love of music come from and whatever is because of my grandma, which who, you know, mind you, we was, they, my grandma, Joe Witness, y'all ain't supposed to be listening to that secular stuff. It's kind of just like, you know, some of the, uh, Baptists and Catholics or whatever. Yeah, they don't like you listening to certain type of secular music, certain sects of the, uh, Christianity or whatever. Jehovah Witnesses the same way. Um, but yeah, my grandparents used to listen to all of that old goodies, okay? And so we used to get into it and everything. So that's where my love of music started to develop, especially black music. And, you know, every now and then we'll hear Frankie Lyman song, okay? And so once I heard that this movie was coming out, it came out in 1998. I was young. I was, I was really young. Um, you know, my mama loves music. So of course, you know, you got people like... Vivica A. Fox, you got uh, Halle Berry, uh, Lila Rashawn, you had um, Lorenz Tate, you had Clifton Powell playing, um, you know, Halle Berry's lawyer in the movie who she was playing Zola Taylor. You know, you had all of these cameos of these people. You had Little Richard up in the, um, may he rest in peace in the movie, you know, and it was such like back then those were the black actors and actresses that we always looked at okay we gave them props we always went to the movies to go see their stuff so of course you coming out with this movie like this i don't know nothing really really about the backstory because i was young as ever and we went to the movies this is back in the day when we actually go to the movies as family and so we go see why do fools fall in love um it was one of those movies that of course it was a black film it's about a black artist you know so of course Unfortunately, I don't feel like it got like the um recognition that it needed. Let me see how much did it make in the box office. <clears throat> it says that it made twelve thousand. Well, no, that's wrong. It made twelve million four hundred and sixty one thousand seven hundred and seventy three dollars. That is good in the box office. That's good, you know. For it, it feels like an independent film, but I'm pretty sure that it wasn't. But anyway, it was um a fascinating story, and it made me I love going to watch a movie or you know looking at a trailer of a movie that's making me want to go look at the uh go look up the stuff, and that's what it was with um you know why do fools fall in love because Frankie Lyman. We ain't even really got to talk about the movie because the movie is really just about his life and we can just go into his life. That story has always, even as an adult till this day, it has fascinated me, especially given that now I am at an age where I can, you know, have a look deeper into things and I can have a better understanding. And it's just like, how in the world did this all happen? to this man who only lived to be 26 years old and wind up having three wives and being a has-been at 20 years old already. Girl, I said it was a lot of, his story is literally a cautionary tale. And this is why, I, it just shows how, if I was to ever have kids, I wouldn't want my child or my kids to be in any type of industry, in the music industry, um, in the, um, what is the acting industry? I wouldn't want them to be in nothing like that at a young age. No, 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 no. Because those main two industries, they're so predatory. They are so predatory. And I felt bad for the artists. You go back and you look at, um, a lot of these, uh, doo-wop artists, um, artists from the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and you look at their catalog and you look at some of the music that's probably still being sampled till this day. And if they're still alive, you see how much money they making off of that. 
And they should have been making all these years, and they wasn't. They were getting ripped off. They was getting played. They was getting used. And mind you, when Frankie Lyman was alive, this was back in the day where black people made albums or black people had a hit song. And instead of it just going mainstream and getting so much recognition or whatever, you would have a white group or a white artist come in, and they would take the song and get that recognition and, and, and take it as their own. And they couldn't do nothing about it. Y'all saw um Dream Girls. I know y'all saw Dream Girls when they put the song out. And next thing you know, gonna buy me a Cadillac. All that gentrification of the song and everything. Took all of the seasoning. Couldn't even put a little dash of hot sauce on it. They sucked that all off and said, they put it under the sink and rinsed it off and said, no, we don't want no flavor in it. And that's exactly what these artists, these black artists had to go through. That's why back in the day, some of these artists, our black artists, had to release albums if they put the cover out they didn't have their faces on there just so we could sell just so the white people could get it so because nine and ten they probably wouldn't get it if they knew that it was a black artist sometimes you know if it was a black person that was really singing this until they actually brought it and they realized oh, okay yeah it is and i do like them so let me give them a chance because i already got the album you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. That is crazy how, you know, racism and everything was back in the day. And it's still like that today to a certain extent. We see all of our work. We, as black folks, I don't care what nobody say, we move the needle. We move the needle in just about everything. And everybody copies it. Everybody wants to be us. But when it's time to be us and be for us, not too many people show up. You know, we still see, we set certain trends and, you know, you see others coming in, taking it, getting popular off of it. We've seen this. We've seen this. And so, it's a cautionary tale. Also, I would never let a child be in the industry because, listen, I would have to be with my child 24-7. And half the time, they don't want that to happen because they want to take advantage. They want to take advantage. They want to be able to do whatever it is that they want to do to these kids or whatever. And that's how these kids, you see what's going on with these Disney stars, these cat child kids that was on Nickelodeon and Disney and all that stuff. And they just so messed up these days, most of them. Mm-mm. We're not doing that. Okay? They're getting hooked on drugs. Mentally, they're not together. Baby... That's what was going on with Frankie Lyman. And I'm just sitting here like, how does something like this happen? Girl, let's just get to the story, okay? So you got Why Do Fools Fall In Love. Like I said, it is the telling of the life of Frankie Lyman and his three wives. Mind you, Frankie Lyman died at 26 years old. Frankie Lyman wound up marrying three women. Zola Taylor, well, we're going to say Elizabeth Water, Zola Taylor, and... I think her name is Amira, okay, War, uh, uh, Lyman, all within probably the last couple of years of each other, three, four years of each other. Mind you, he was young as hell. And they did say at one point, I had to look it up, he had a child, but unfortunately the child died, I think probably like right around childbirth or something like that. And I said, thank goodness. I don't know, maybe he probably would have been better if he was a father, and that probably would have gave him the intentions to get his life on track for real, for real, and not go the way that he's went. And he probably would have still been here. But then again, we see a lot of people who are fathers and mothers who fell to the praise and the temptation of drugs and all of that stuff. And girl, it was a mess. It was a mess, baby. You get up into the story. Frank Lyman was born in 19, I think 1942. He died. Let me see. Let me look it up. I want to get it clear. He died in 1968. He was born September 30th, 1942, and he died February 27th, 1968. Oh, that's coming up. Okay, that's crazy. So when he first started off, do you know he was in that group in uh, the teenagers? And I think he was like around 12, 13 years old. He was from the church. He was like 12, 13 years old. He wound up getting signed in this dual wild group. Uh, the teenagers and he really he wasn't the main singer he just so happened to be the main singer uh because when they went to do the audition the person Hector I think that's what his name was he put the group together he was sick so he couldn't sing they let him sing the main um the lead or whatever and so he became the lead of the group now what bothered me about this movie and it's probably mostly because of the fact that I don't think that that there's really that many recordings of 
Frankie Lyman because when he became an adult that they could use, you know, when his voice changed. Because throughout the movie, I think only one time we actually heard a somewhat mature voice, you know, when he was singing on the stage when he passed out. That's the only time. Other than that, it was just weird at times to see, you know, um, <laughs> that's the part that bothered me. Uh, to see Lorenz Tate playing this guy that's supposed to be a child, okay? I wish, in a sense, they probably would have had somebody come in and play a younger version of him when he was, like, at the very start of the teenagers, when they go in for the audition and, you know, they get the, um, they get all of that and they get signed, they do a couple of gigs or whatever, and then show him going through puberty and then leading up to him being in, being Lorenz Tate, you know what I'm saying? Because it was just weird watching him lip syncing and we can tell that he was lip syncing, um, of course, because that's not his, uh, voice, um, <clears throat> It was just so obvious. It was just so obvious. So that was probably like the only thing that bothered me about the movie. Um, he was a bad lip singer. Okay. That's just, that's just all that it was. And it just, I was like, how come they couldn't get a, a younger kid and then probably two years into the career or once they fully, fully got established, then get somebody that looked like, then get Lorenz Tate in there. But hey, that's neither here nor there. So basically, they get signed, you know, and back in the day, they had them doing different, you know, uh, artists, black artists doing different, uh, you know, like showcases with each other. You know how they doing these little R&B showcases experience where they have all these um, old school artists or whatever coming to, coming together and doing that. That's basically what they was doing to get these to get the people out here, you know. Um, oh, they had Richard Roundtree up in here, too. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you get that, and then while he's in the process of, you know, being in this group, you got all these different black acts doing the same, what they say, the chitlin' circuit, doing the same thing, and you run across one of the groups called The Platters with Zola Taylor. That's where he first meet her. They start kicking it with each other. Baby, when I tell you, I had to look this up because I'm sitting here, and it, it just was bothering me. I'm like... If this man was 26 years old when he passed away, he is being accused of marrying three women all around the same time frame, within the same time frame of the last few years of his life. How? And then in one part of the movie, Zola said that him and her was messing around with each other for like 10 years off and on. And I'm sitting here like, if he was 26, y'all was 10 years off and on, that's 16. She was older than him. But when they first met and first really started kicking with each other, he was 14 years old and she was 17. I was like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, my goodness. What are y'all doing? Um, When he met Elizabeth, he was uh 20. She was 19. You know what I'm saying? And I don't know what age Amira was, but that was when he got out the army and all that stuff or whatever. But, hey. It's just the age thing or whatever. And I don't know if it's because of the time. I'm just sitting here like, how come nobody said anything about this? You know, I know he told Zola whatever that his father had left them or whatever. But, you know, at this point in time, it's it, it just really gave that feeling like boys would be boys. That's how they looked at I, I don't know. It was just weird. Weird in today's thinking, you know. I was just like, mm, you was a little hoe. Like, where was the parental the guidance, the guardianship, there was nobody around that was watching. Ugh, okay. Anyway, you know, so he do all of that. And, um, you got that going on. And then when your group is getting successful, you write the head, why do fools fall in love? And he's with the teenagers. Next thing you know, we find out that he's going solo. And that one particular scene in the movie where Hector and the teenager group, the whole group found out that, you know, he was supposed to be going solo and that he been knew about it. That hurt me so bad. I was, I, I felt hurt because we see stuff like that so much. We see that it's so crazy because even to this day, if you have groups that come out, 
we see them break up, especially now, groups do not last. That's why we barely have any groups, especially within uh, our music, like our community, black music. You know what I'm saying? We don't have black groups like that. And if we do, they're very far in between. Okay? And it's a rarity at this point. Um, and it just feels like back in the 80s, back in the uh, 60s and 70s, we could have groups and even the 50s. We can have black groups come together. Boy bands, girl bands, you know, boy and girl bands or whatever. You know, whatever it was. And they can be successful. For some reason, after like the 90s, early 2000s, it just don't happen no more. I don't know. Like, everybody is not looking for a group. Uh, and it's like, if you get a group together, it don't stay together. They barely get an album out. If they do, they barely get a single out. And then it's like, okay, well, this ain't going to work. Let's go ahead and do solo. It's like, nobody is really checking for the group thing anymore, you know? Um, Y'all seen the stuff that happened with June's Diary, uh, even though that was a mess. I have to give credit and props to Frank Gatson for trying to get them girls to be here and there, whatever. But the people just, the labels wasn't trying or whatever. I don't know what the issue was. And I don't know what the problem is. Do y'all feel like y'all know what it is? Why we can't get black groups together anymore? Um, But hey, it is what it is. So you got sad. And then to find out that, you know, he was going solo and then he already knew about it, but he didn't tell them and all that. And he had known about it for two months and had already cut the record. But I, I cannot stand stuff like that. And we see it all the time. You see these groups come out for a couple of months. I mean, for a couple of years, put out maybe two albums. If that next thing you know, the lead singer going solo or somebody else that's the second lead going solo. And then that means the whole group is about to dismantle. We've seen it so many times just in the past few years okay we've seen it with the one directions and the what is it the the, the the fifth harmonies okay um and only one person actually succeeds in that and that's crazy and then you know i just don't understand how come these people be pushing these artists to go solo so quickly and that's what they did with frankie you know it was one of those Oh, he got something and we want to capitalize off of it. We want to use it to the very last drop. And they really thought that they was going to get something out of him. And as soon as he went solo, that solo career basically didn't happen the way that they thought it was, nor he. Okay? He was bad. Some people, even though they got the voice, they probably got the looks, they probably got the moves. Some people are just more better as a group instead of by themselves and that's what it felt like with frankie because i really do feel like if he was still in the group the teenagers they probably would have been you know on his ass about the things that he was doing and probably would have kept him in line a little bit more and because he was by himself that mean he had a little bit more freedom to get into a lot of stuff and nobody was holding him accountable. Nobody was really telling him to stop or whatever. So it was all for himself. You know, that's what I feel. Um, and then you have him getting with Zola. They playing around with each other. I said, child, y'all are young, 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 young. And he get into all of this mess to the point where, you know, um, he winds up leaving her because they was going off and on, going to Philadelphia. He meets Elizabeth, okay? She was in a movie played by Vivica Fox. She was up there, you know, shoplifting. Um, and then in order to save her from getting locked up or whatever, getting caught by security, he came up and approached her and made it seem like he was with her. And so that's how their connection started and their relationship started. She seen him, you know, performing and everything. Oh, you saw Paula J. Park up in that too, playing her friend. Girl, she she disappointed me so much now. But at the same time, I was just like, okay, so they get together. Um, and at that point in time, this is when we see the downfall of him. By the time he got with Elizabeth, he's no longer this popular artist. Like, his name still rings a little bit. He can get booked here. He can get booked there. But ain't nobody out here trying to buy his music or whatever. He literally was staying in Zola Taylor's apartment. Zola Taylor had left and got married and came back. And then you bring another woman already into her apartment. And then you go and get your own place with this woman. 
and you're a full-on drug addict. You are a full-on drug addict, a heroin addict, a heroin addict, okay? I mean, just shooting up. I think, oh, I cannot stand it, baby. I do not like looking at people who have needle marks in their arms. That does something to me. I'm not scared of needles or anything like that. It just, just like... I don't know. It just be like, why would you want to go around like that? And I know once you get started, especially on something heavy like that, especially heroin, that's probably one of the toughest things to, you know, get clean off of, right? And so it's just like, ugh, don't start it because you already know that it can lead you down to a place where you ain't going to be able to get off of it. You know what I'm saying? Um, It's very deadly, you know? And I was just like, to look at them, ugh. No, I don't like it. And I don't trust people that do, uh, y'all shoot up. I said this in another video. I not trust people that, uh, shoot up. Y'all scared me. Okay. Cause that means that y'all can do any and everything. And y'all ain't got no fear about life. Cause y'all are literally putting the drugs directly in your veins. Okay. Directly. I said, baby, you are taking a risk. I don't like those type of risks. Okay. Um, and so you got that going on, right? And you know, like I said, he's with Elizabeth. And this is where shit gets fucked up for me, okay? As you're looking at the movie and you go and you read up on this, my whole thing is, Elizabeth, girlfriend, you knew that this man was uh, a little crackheadish. <laughs> you knew he was a druggie, okay? You saw the needle marks. You saw everything that was going on. And then he put you through the ringer to the point where he was stealing money. Y'all couldn't pay y'all rent. You had to get kicked out. You had to leave Philadelphia, go back to New York, uh... Uh, uh, stay with your mama and all that stuff, whatever, at full time. And, you know, I, I'm not finna do nothing with somebody that does that. You know what I'm saying? You got people running after you because you owe them money for drugs and all this stuff. I said, what? And you gonna stay? You gonna stay? Mind you, Elizabeth had just had a baby when he met, when, she, when, when he had met Elizabeth. Frankie... Rolled up on her. She was in Philadelphia eight months after she had a baby. She had an eight-month-year-old girl at home with her mama. I'm sitting here like, baby, why you ain't living with your mama taking care of your baby girl? I'm pretty sure your baby girl is still breastfeeding at this point. Why are you out here in Philadelphia, girl? I was just like, all right. You know, it is what it is. Um, That was crazy in itself. And this is how I knew that, you know, Miss Elizabeth just really wasn't that smart, okay? Because you leave your kid... And then you go into the store, you're shoplifting, um, you get involved with this man, you see him, he's a has-been at this point, y'all struggling. It, and, and, and listen, I'm not judging anybody that gets with somebody or anybody that's struggling in life, because everybody is. But it is a choice to stay with, uh, to get into a relationship with somebody who is a drug addict. And I'm talking about that hard drug stuff, too. Okay, we ain't just talking about weed or whatever. Okay, that's fine. Whatever. I don't care. You know, I'm talking about cocaine and heroin and all that ecstasy and meth and all that other stuff, baby. You, we, we don't do those, okay? Pills and all that. No, no, no. You are literally making a choice to get involved with somebody that is having a heavy addiction, addiction and then you wind up getting married to this person on purpose. That is very intentional, and whatever happens, happens, and that is your fault. Because why would you do it? Why would you do it? I said, girl, what? It got so bad, y'all. It got so fucking bad that she had to go out there and prostitute herself. She taking dicks from other niggas, and this man is just drunk on the floor and using up all of the money to go get high and all of that stuff, and then getting pissed off at her. Getting pissed off at her because she wouldn't give him no money and all this stuff, and she called him a has been and everything, and woo, 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 and you going to take her doll and, and, and tell her, get on your knees, get on your knees. I said, girl, at that moment in time, that would be the time that I stop. I, first of all, I'm not finna sell my body for nobody, Okay. It ain't, baby, I'm, mm -mm. I don't think that's something I could do, okay? No, I know that's something I can't do. I just have to sleep on the streets, okay? Ashley ain't finna be sucking dick or selling ass for nobody. I'm just sorry, okay? It just, and I know sometimes they say never say never. You never know what you do when you're down on your luck. I just know that's one thing that I can't do, okay? It, it just ain't in me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just being honest, all right? But to do that, and I guess she was head over heels in love. I don't know. Love make you do crazy things. 
But when that man put your baby out the window, and I'm talking about the dog, I cannot stand it. Like, after looking at four color girls, when that, <sighs> I said, why do y'all have to do stuff like this? And then the dog bit him, and that's what made the dog, him drop the dog. He bit, she bit me, baby. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. After you just screamed at her and told her to get down on her knees, I said, what? Get the fuck out of here. That was the best acting that Vivica did in the movie, okay? I was like, oh, my God. I felt that. It felt like that was her real dog, and he really did that to her. Like, wow. Wow. I said, good job, Vivica. Um, meanwhile, so after that, he winds up going out there with Zola, She's still doing her music thing, but then she got kicked out the group at the, uh, uh, because she had got walking pneumonia. And they said, bitch, you know, okay, you sick or whatever. Two days off, that's it. You taking a little bit too long, we're going to have to replace you. I said, girl, what? She said, yeah, gain them off because 11 years of my life, and then they just going to kick me out like that because I had got a little sicky sick. I said, you know, that's how they doing. That's how they doing. But she had a backup. She said, Zola. Taylor and a male, all male review, and you know she had a nice house. That was a nice house out there in LA. That man came out there, and I said, "Now, ma'am, you knew that he was struggling because that's the reason why he called you because he couldn't get no gigs or whatever. He needed some help, and he was still doing drugs. So you mean to tell me you still gonna take a chance with this man? He hurt you in the past, and so now you gonna bring him back? Mm 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 mm. I said it was some young games." All of these people are young as hell, and that's what we have to keep on remembering. They are so young. They are immature, if you ask me. All right? Especially him. And you're doing add drugs on top of that. And I was just like, God damn. Okay? She was married. She did get divorced. Um, He's staying over there. You know, next thing you know, he get a gig, and he was able to sing and do his thing. But at one point, oh, when he was with Elizabeth, he did get a gig. But he couldn't sing it because he passed out because he was, he damn it, he overdosed on the stage, I believe. All right, that's what happened when he passed out. Um, then you out there, you get the TV gig. Okay, that kind of revised him a little bit, get a little bit of interest, but it really didn't do anything. And see, Zola, you know, you, you, you see this man and you know his history and you know his background and nobody is getting him help. Unless I didn't read that or whatever, nobody is getting this man help, right? And of course, you can't force somebody to get help. But why would you put yourself in a predicament again, just like with Elizabeth wind up marrying this man? So she said, mind you, she had already been married pri uh, previously and... You marrying this man or really being in a relationship with this person who has all of this on him is in a full-blown addiction. And unless you get some help, 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 that addiction is still there, okay? And that is exactly what was going on. You get married to this man in Mexico. I guess Mexico was City Hall back then because that's what I keep on saying. You saw that up in, did Tina Turner and Ike go down to Mexico and get married? I can't. You know, they got married in Mexico. I said, damn, y'all couldn't just go down to the City Hall? Uh, it felt like I was trying to do some illegal stuff or whatever. Y'all was trying to cut corners or whatever. But then Zora had to go, or I should say Zola had to go on a little, um, you know, she was doing a little tour or whatever and some, a little singing gig that was going to be like four or five months in Asia. I said, girlfriend, uh-uh. As soon as I heard that, I said, ma'am, ma'am, why, why, why? And Frankie is so codependent in the sense that he needs somebody to leech off of because he got to use them. And he was a user, and that's basically what he did to her. Baby, when he she came back, her whole house was gone and messed up. In four to five months, how do you have your the house just looking like it's been destitute for 10 years? And I was just like, I, oh, I felt so bad for her. And then you're going to have to, uh, before that, you had your ex come up in there. She ended up with her man. They fight. That shit was funny. When she pulls her wig off, baby, hilarious. And she fell up in that pool. Girl, listen, Halle Berry and Vivica Fox. When I tell you they made this movie for me, everybody played their part, right? But it was Vivica and Halle Berry for me. Like, I just love me some Halle Berry because Halle Berry is such a versatile actress because she can give you very much uppity, classy, elegant, and she can give you hood, and it sounds so good, okay? 
and I mean correct, you know what I'm saying? Like, she could get down and gutter with it. And she was able to go toe-in-toe -to -toe with Vivica when they was going back and forth with each other. And that scene, oh, my goodness, it was everything, okay? It's so fun. Um, but, yeah, the women were dumb. And, and I don't even want to say they were dumb. It's just that they were caught up. And I feel like this man probably charmed them. But yes, they really wasn't using their senses. You know, they their their intuition, their their, you know, like this just don't feel right. Should I do this? But I love him. They were thinking more so with their heart instead of their minds, okay? Because sometimes your heart can leave you astray. You know, I can you can love somebody, but that don't mean that they good for you. And he was not good for nobody at this time, including himself. Baby, she come home and the house just gone. Baby, I Oh, when she freaking, uh, and she said she had to go stay with her sister. And not only that, her bank account was drained. Everything she worked for all of those years is gone to the point where she literally had to go live with her sister. She ain't have nothing. Can you imagine? Can you imagine somebody that you trusted with your livelihood and you come back and they destroyed it and they are nowhere to be found? nowhere to be found oh my goodness oh my goodness and when they was in that bathroom and um you know elizabeth had to tell her i'm sorry about the house it was a beautiful house and i'm so sorry but i never came back up there because you know she had said that they had the neighbors coming up there calling the police because he had a woman up in there and they kept on arguing and fighting or whatever and i guess zola automatically assumed that it was uh elizabeth but it wasn't according to elizabeth but my whole thing is, I felt bad for her when she said, you would think 18 years I would still, I, I wouldn't be still feeling away, but I do. It's 18 years. I don't care. That's a big old thing. Like, yo, whole, you stole from me. That is something that I will never be able to get over. Somebody stealing from me. It's one thing to get my house fucked up, but to steal from me and to drain my bank account. Oh, I would never be able to trust a living soul ever again, okay? Um, meanwhile, when Zola got up on that stage, that stand, and she was like, <laughs> she said, the Lord get that, um, the person that married them died. The lawyer that helped put the marriage together, he died or something. And then the other one was in the hospital. He couldn't come down there because he had his feet cut off. Now, ma'am, I'm sitting here like, did he have diabetes or something? Like, what's going on? The story just didn't make sense at all. Everybody was just like, girl, what? Okay. But um, I said, so we just going to lie on the stand like that. Then they get to the third wife, Amira, who she met him in Georgia after he came out the army. Uh, wind up walking into the bathroom while she was in there and you know they do their little thing and she was totally different from them okay you got an entertainer you got a city girl you know what i'm saying and then you got this meek down home southern girl who's a, a very educated who's a school teacher who's basically about the lord go to church every sunday don't miss a day um no sex before marriage because we saw that and, you know, he fell for her. He was a totally different person, you know. Um, and they wound up getting married, like, within months of knowing each other. Like, a few months within knowing each other. I said, oh, no. See? Uh-uh. And then you get picked up. You get picked up because you had went AWOL. And then you got dishonorably discharged from the Army. And then you going out to the church and it's like his demon started playing with him when he saw that little boy singing because he was from the church, you know, and he used to sing in a choir as a child, you know, um, and then that's when he tried to get back and go to New York and get a gig or whatever. And his old record label person, the, the, the his old record label head, he basically said, you a washed up junkie. Okay. Don't nobody want you. And he was clean at that time, I guess. And then he wound up overdosing in his uh, after he went to see, you know, the review or whatever. You saw Zola on the stage and she was singing. He went back to the apartment where he was staying at at that moment and he wound up overdosing. And that's how he passed away. Now, see, they was trying to figure out who was the rightful owner of his estate or his uh, widow. 
because again, you got three marriages. You got three women claiming to be married. And Elizabeth, technically they said it was common law because she technically was still married to her first husband. Then they didn't know or couldn't produce the real uh, decree of marriage from Mexico or divorce from uh, Zola Taylor. But then there was a paper and certificate and all of that with in a license or whatever with a mirror. So when I was watching this before I had even knew who was going to get it and I had looked into it, I literally thought a mirror was going to get it, the last wife because it just felt legitimate. Like gee, that was the last person she he was with and they got the papers and all of that stuff. Girl, they wound up giving it to Elizabeth. But then she appealed that. And I said, you appealed that throughout so many years. And I was like, do you really think that it's worth it? And I said, no, it's not. Because as you was listening to it, you get the uh, head of the label on the stand and basically he was cheating him out of money, wasn't giving him royalties and, you know, signing his name on stuff so he can get money for it, the, la the label head, um, saying that he was owed basically like $4 million worth of royalties. And they was like, girl, they thinking that they finna get $4 million. And so they come up with this plan like we'll just split it. You know, each of us get one point something million dollars. And I said, no, it's not going to be one point something million dollars. You'll probably get a million dollars. And technically speaking, I'm sitting here like, mm, no, I don't feel like it's going to be that much either because of the way that they played them. And these contracts were and how shady the people were back then. They were even more shady then than they are now, you know. People were very much taking advantage of these artists, taking advantage of these naive people, right? And so they really thought that they was going to get like $4 million. And of course I said, now why the fuck would you look at Elizabeth? She cannot be trusted. I'm sorry. Sometimes they say, don't judge a book by its cover, but you judge that bitch, okay? <laughs> when we first saw her, she was in jail and they put her subtitle as Petty Thief, okay? You got Zola Taylor, a uh, singer. You got uh uh Emira Emara um um Lyman a school teacher or whatever and then you got Elizabeth petty thief I said damn bitch and you gonna trust the thief no as soon as she got that judgment ruled in her favor she said fuck y'all I'm finna take this money and then so after all of that they had to go through all the courts of appeal just so it can go back to Amira the last wife and she only got fifteen thousand dollars out of that and that's what she was originally offered by the head of the record label and I said so y'all went through all of this for fifteen thousand dollars bitch it wouldn't have been me like I get the principle of it because Yes, it's like you would think that after so many years of people doing so many samples of your one song or your whole catalog and making it hot again and, you know, what, what sparked this off was because it started in 1986. What sparked this off was, you know, Elizabeth was in jail. She heard Diana Ross doing Why Do Fools Fall In Love, the remake, her uh, remake of the song or whatever. And so she like, let me call in, let me try to get some money off of this or whatever because I'm doing some royalties or whatever because that was my husband. And she couldn't even do that. And I'm pretty sure it's so many other people have uh, re uh, uh, sampled that song. Like, it's just, oh. You know, like the DeBarges. How many people have uh, sampled a dream, a sample fantasy? You know, da 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 da. So many people have sampled that. So many people have sampled Juicy Fruit. So many people have, oh, sampled so many songs. Like, uh, what is it, Dion Warwick? I really hope these people had their stuff in order. And, you know, a lot of these artists, had it not be for the shady practices that was going on back in the day, and because it was racist and all of this stuff or whatever, these artists, if the practices was done right and people was on their up and up and they were being honest and they weren't trying to fuck people over, these black artists would be multi, multi, multi millionaires to this day. You wouldn't see these people struggling unless they did it themselves. Like they squandered their money and misbudgeted their money and just spent money here and there, whatever, because they wasn't used to having it. But the majority of them probably would have still been multimillionaires and living good. You know what I'm saying? But we don't see that. We see more of them living, uh, having to restart over because they lost everything or they was getting taken and all of this stuff or whatever. It's a sad thing. It's a sad story. My whole thing is, um, 
that the whole story with Frank and Lamb, like I said, is very predatory. It is very predatory. Like he was so young and he was doing all of this with these women. And the women were young too. And it's just like, wow. Like none of that could, I don't think that could fly these days. Especially with the day and age of social media. People would be, you know, calling it out and everything. And it's just like, I don't know. It's just uh, 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 I don't know. The music industry take advantage of these people, and it's just a disgusting thing. But I will say this. The movie as a whole, it was a really good movie. It's on Tubi. I watched it on Tubi. They literally just put it back on Tubi, you know, and I feel like they did it for uh, Black History Month. But it's on Tubi if you guys want to watch it. And if you haven't watched it, I don't know where you been at, okay? I feel like every black person should have watched it, Okay. Um, Vivica Fox and Halle Berry, again, they were the best in this movie. Vivica Fox is naturally funny. And that whole scene when they were sitting down at the table together and it was no dialogue. It was just them looking and the facial expressions and mostly Vivica's facial expression. Oh my goodness. It was everything. I absolutely love that. It was funny. Um, I feel like. I would love to see Vivica and Halle Berry in another movie together. I would love to see that, like, in this, like, today. Like, I would love to see that. They work so well together, you know? Um, we already know Lorenz Tate. He's still out here doing his thinking. Lorenz Tate still looks exactly like he did. <laughs> he still looks like he did in the movie in 1998. Just slight bit older, but not that much. He still looks the exact same. If he was to shave his face, oh my God, he still would look the same. Okay. But, um, yeah, the movie was great. But my thing is, y'all got to be careful. Y'all got to be careful. Y'all would intentionally, like, for love, would y'all really just be with somebody if they, like I'm saying, I don't have a problem. I'm not one of those people that's so materialistic, um, oh, you got to have this type of job or whatever. And maybe it's because I come from humble beginnings or because, especially in this day and age, I know the struggle and we know everybody is not going to be at the level that we are or whatever. But sometimes I feel like we do set certain standards that we want to follow and have in a person. But then sometimes it's like, because we got these high standards or some people have high standards, maybe they are missing the person that they really supposed to be with because they set their standards just a little bit too high or whatever. I don't have a problem being with somebody who is struggling in the sense of they're not, you know, you know, they're not a millionaire. They're not a thousandaire. Well, you got to have a couple of thousand and you're making a couple of thousand a month, but you're not at the, the, the job level that you want to be, but you're working towards it. My thing is, as long as you're working towards it, you're not just laying down on your ass and doing nothing, but I see you doing something, I can work with that. You know what I'm saying? Because at that point, we all in the same boat. You still contribute in some way. You still trying to contribute or whatever. You're just not at the level that you want to do be, but we can work together to get both of us to the level that we want. You know, that type of thing. But if you just with a broke bitch that really ain't doing shit and ain't trying to do nothing, man or woman, oh, baby, we can't do that. Oh, we can't do that. You got a drug problem. I'm sorry. We can't do that. We can't do that. Because you're not finna, I'm not finna come home and see my shit gone. <laughs> We not finna do that, okay? It is just not finna happen. Not in 2024, baby. It, it's just not, you know? Um. So, yeah. Y'all tell me how y'all feel about it. If y'all got kids out here, would y'all put y'all kids up in the music and um, uh, 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 entertainment industry? This young? I the bitch. Hell the fuck no. Anyway. <laughs> you listen. Oh, my God. Like, I looked up the, um... I was looking at this YouTube channel called Black Femininity too, and they just do all of these uh, different black artists and um, uh, black actors and all this stuff and their history and everything. I wind up looking at the whole history of what is it, mindless behavior, and the reason why they didn't get to the potential into the peak where they needed to be. Oh, I had no idea all of the stuff that was going on behind the scenes. Fucking little kids up, okay? By baby, they be inflicting childhood traumas and just ugh trauma on these people. But yeah, y'all tell me how y'all feel about it. That was why I do fools fall in love. That was my song again. 
Um, goody, goody. <laughs> it just bothered me so much that you had this grown man playing this young with this young boy's voice that hadn't even gone through puberty yet. <laughs> You're 20 something years old and you up here trying, well, you're playing a 20 year old or whatever, and you up here with this same 12 year old, 13 year old voice. Like, come on, come on. They could have got a younger kid. That was my only complaint about this movie. But yeah, you guys tell me how you feel. And uh, I will see you later. Peace.